Hello. Hello. Hi, Steve. How are you? Just <laughs> just, on, just on time. We were just getting our technological okay, thing fine. set up to, to make sure that we are on Facebook. But okay, I believe fine. we are now we are now live. So it, it's great to be here for the for the third and, and final webinar on the, the findings of our research and to share it with the community. So first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who was here on a Sunday. Just want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. So maybe Sheev, can you just confirm that you can hear me okay before I keep waffling on? <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Or maybe somebody just type a quick yes in the mm -hmm. chat box. Yes, I can hear you, Martin. Perfect. Yes, perfect. that's good. Thank, th thank you, Tanya. So as I said, it, it's great to be here. And this is our, our third webinar on sharing some of the findings of our research with, on the Mauritian diaspora in Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom. So some of you may have dialed in for earlier sessions and, and welcome back if you have. But if you're here for, for, the, for a new session, we look forward to hearing your thoughts, your, your concerns, your aims, and, and everything you want to learn about from the research and more. We're delighted, most importantly, today to be joined by two people who have been incredibly helpful and very gracious with their time and energies to help us with the research, one from Canada, Sheev, and one from the UK, Yashoda. And they've been incredibly gracious, as I said, with, with their time and, most importantly, their connections. So I'm really excited to hear their reflections on the research. So. If you dialed in over the last couple of sessions or maybe checked it out on Facebook, you would have heard enough of my accent. So I won't say I won't talk too much longer. But just again to give you some some house rules, you know, hopefully your everybody's mic should be muted when, when somebody else is speaking. But if there's any issues with that, please just make sure that your mic is muted. We are being streamed on Facebook, so make sure that if you want to engage via Facebook, comment, like, share get involved, ask questions via Facebook, and we're very happy to answer. We have colleagues from IOM looking at that and, and feeding questions back to us. And of course, here on Zoom, if you're joining directly on the webinar, please use the chat box to, to have a conversation with each other, with us, most importantly as well. And please use the Q&A function for any questions that you may have from the presentations. But it would be remiss of me not to begin with, with a very warm thank you to, to everybody that's helped with the research, but most importantly to, to IOM as well, who have been the, the, the heartbeat of the project. So I hand over to Tanya for some welcoming remarks and we'll get going from there. So Tanya, the floor is very much yours. Hi Martin and hi everyone. So uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for our last session. So just before uh, we jump into the most interesting part of this event, uh, which are the recommendations. I just wanted to give a quick uh, overview about the project. So I think some of you might already know uh, about our consultations we held last year, as most of you were, were part of it. So from October to December 2020, we held a series of consultations with the diaspora from three pilot countries, which are Australia, Canada, and the UK, uh, with the objective to help us better understand the diaspora and to uh, strengthen the relationship between Mauritius and the diaspora. So now, what we have, now that we have finalized these consultations, we're very pleased to hold these uh, three sessions uh, with you all from uh, all around the world. And uh, to hear from you about your priorities so we will better support these initiatives and programs. Uh, before we start, I would like to sincerely thank uh, members of the advisory group in the three pilot countries for all their efforts and contribution. Uh, despite the pandemic, uh, they made this project a success. So uh, I want to welcome today, uh, as Martin said, two very um, two two of our uh, advisory group members from the UK and Canada, Mr. Steve Shichan and Ms. Yeshida Ashambi. So I wish also to extend my thanks to uh, Emira and Martin who have conducted this research and who has been leading these sessions. So just before uh, we, we start with the recommendations, I would like just to quickly go over the agenda. So Emira and Martin uh, will uh, go over the recommendations and we will have the opportunity to have uh, Shiv and Yeshoda sharing their reflections on the project, then we can proceed to the most important part of the session, which is your feedbacks uh, for Q&A uh, and discussed about the prioritization. So don't hesitate during, all, during throughout the session to share your questions and we'll take those during the Q&A section. So I think Martin has already uh, went over the, the house rules and they're also in the chat box. So I won't go over this 
again. So I will hand over to Martin and Mira. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. Th thank you, Tanya. And just as I look behind Sheev's shoulder on his camera, I see a picture of Mauritius, and I'm, I'm getting quite jealous when I when I see the landscape, and I'm wanting to visit quite soon. But look, just to echo what, what Tanya has said, and you'll see also sharing of a link in the chat box for one-to-one -one conversations with us just beyond this session as well. What we've, what we've learned and what we've heard, for example, from the first two sessions is, is that there's a lot of interest from the diaspora and, and keen to ask more questions and engage. So you'll see a, ca a Calendly link where you can actually book one-to-one -one conversations as well, because we're also quite aware that it can, it can be quite a lot to digest in one webinar and, and discussion. So that option is there and we look forward to, to hearing for, for, from you in, in due course on that front. So I'll hand over to the, to the real brains of the operation and, and my, my chief colleague and chief diaspora troublemaker in, in, in chief, as I say, so Ms. Amira Ajeti, Ajeti to go over the presentation of the, the findings of the report. Amira, the floor is yours. And after that, we then will bridge into Shiv and Yashoda and we can have the wider conversation from there. So Amira, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good day to all. Um, and as I, I suppose it's a good day as it's springtime in most of our uh, countries. Thank you all, as Martin said, for joining us on a Sunday, uh, for taking your time to be part of this webinar. Uh, we are definitely very thankful to everyone for sharing their time throughout this project, as well as now in the final stages, as well as in the future, as there will be a lot of follow up to it. On that note, um, I would invite everyone to please engage uh, as much as you can, uh, whether you're following us through Facebook on the live stream, as well as through this platform. So uh, we are monitoring comments, suggestions, questions on each of these platforms. Uh, everyone who is on Zoom, please submit your questions, concerns, comments at the Q&A box uh, that we have here. And um, as Tanya said, when we get to the most important session of today uh, of uh, questions and answers, we hope it's very interactive. So uh, do feel free to, um, to, to ask as many questions as you have. I uh, won't take more time. I'll go to the PowerPoint presentations now. So I'll share my screen. Just let me know if everything is okay on that. Uh, maybe Martin, you can do that. So I'm sharing it now. Yeah, perfect. Uh, perfect, yeah, perfect. So um, the idea of uh, the presentation today was to give you an overview of some of the preliminary findings of the research, uh, research that wouldn't have been uh, able and successful without the, uh, the, the, the time that was given to us by diaspora members all over their networks that were shared with us, uh, their thoughts, their concerns, and we're immensely thankful of that. And um, as far as the advisory group members and uh, the Shiv and Yashoda that we have here today, uh, we're very thankful of their time. Uh, advisory group members have been critical to the success of this project, and uh, we'll talk more about that in the future uh, slides. The first slide that we have here before you uh, as to why now for diaspora engagement, you will see the cover page of The Economist and the title, The Magic of Diasporas. Uh, indeed, this was a old cover page, so it's probably a decade old, and uh, diaspora has been a topic that has been conversed about uh, for a long time now. However, diaspora engagement is in fact emerging as a key development policy of choice for governments recently as well. And especially now, uh, you will see that the governments have definitely understood the importance of engaging with diaspora to the development of their uh, countries, economic uh, and social. Uh, in that context, if you look at data, there's about uh, over 100 countries around the world that have built some sort of a framework for engagement of their people abroad uh, due to them understanding the importance of it. And in that context, we believe that Mauritius should definitely be part of this conversation and more so should even lead this conversation, considering the strength of its diaspora abroad and the strong voice that the diaspora of Mauritians have abroad um, and uh, to the development of their home countries. So these strong voices and concerns, uh, although critical, should be very uh, important and they are very important to the development of the country. They show passion and interest and care for their home countries. In the Next slide, uh, there is a notion of diaspora capital 
which we have uh, discussed and considered from the very beginning of this project. So it was important for us to understand what is Mauritian diaspora capital. When we say diaspora capital, we are referring to resources available to a country, region, city, location, or organization that are made up of people, networks, finance, ideas, attitudes, and concerns for their place of origin, ancestry, or affinity. Uh, when I say that, um, it means the diaspora capital goes way beyond just remittances, uh, way beyond just uh, investing back home. The resources that the diaspora capital can provide uh, go uh, range from networks, immense networks that can affect the branding of the home country positively, as well as various attitudes and ideas, for instance, work ethic. This can be transferred to the home country by diaspora. Skills transfer is another uh, a strong resource of diaspora. And we'll go more about that later on, but we have understood this while talking to all the Mauritians abroad, as well as doing a lot of research on it. Next, uh, uh, throughout this project and the very beginning, uh, we have looked into some questions, uh, data questions, design questions, and operational questions, which we have attempted to answer throughout this project. Uh, the first questions that we, we found answers to and that we were looking at were, who are the diaspora? So it's extremely important for us to understand the Mauritian diaspora, to define the Mauritian diaspora in order to know what activities uh, should be involved in the diaspora engagement. Where are the diaspora? So for this particular project, it was a pilot project and the key countries of, uh, countries of focus for it were Australia, Canada, and the UK. And we have worked with Mauritian diaspora in all of these countries to understand more about uh, way, where exactly they are and for how long they have been abroad and away from Mauritius and uh, what do they consider as diaspora for them? What are they doing is another very important uh, question. So in order to understand what uh, activities are of uh, importance for diaspora, we need to know what are they doing at the moment. And then we go to the design questions which actually were answered a lot throughout uh, the listening uh, part of this project. So this was a beginning of listening to the diaspora for us. And we say beginning because we strongly believe that that is something that needs to continue throughout uh, and in the future. Uh, listening uh, of the diaspora and listening to the diaspora to understand their needs, their aims, their concerns, their hopes for the Mauritian diaspora. Something that was brought up to us throughout these research interviews is the first point that you see here. Um, it was important to Mauritian diaspora to understand that diaspora, uh, not only diaspora needs to support Mauritius, but also Mauritius needs to support its diaspora. So it needs to be a very uh, mutual, uh, based relationship on benefits and trust for both. It's a win-win in the sense of that Mauritius ought to be involving not only the diaspora members that are successful abroad, but also the vulnerable members of its diaspora. This is extremely important in the context of, for instance, the pandemic, but as well as throughout the engagement with diaspora. It's important to give and uh, to receive. Uh, next, we found answers to not only the current aims and concerns and uh, needs of Mauritian diaspora, but also the interests of diaspora for their future relationship with Mauritius. This is crucial, and this, uh, uh, these answers informed heavily our recommended actions, which we will be presenting today. Next, we have the operational questions that we considered, and those tie back directly to the design questions. Uh, we uh, try to understand what policies, programs, projects can we shape in the short and midterm, and what is the role of each stakeholder in this work. And when we say each stakeholder, that goes beyond uh, simply the government uh, and uh, the diaspora. It involves uh, the private sector. It involves uh, media, academia, and all other non-governmental organizations, which ought to play a very strong uh, point in diaspora engagement. Um, another point of uh, Mauritian diaspora is that uh, you are very lucky to have a very engaging diaspora and a diaspora that has a passion for homeland. 
And the next thing is uh, to understand how to build a better culture of diaspora engagement in Mauritius and what are the mechanisms to do so? What are the mechanisms that the diaspora as well as all stakeholders prefer? The next slide um, gives an overview of the methodology that we use for this project. And I will try to be as brief as possible. Uh, but uh, as a first step for us, since the project started early last year, it was important to consider the effects of the pandemic and that we won't be able to do any field research. So we have actually relied on uh, diaspora digital outreach as well as digital outreach with Mauritian stakeholders in Mauritius. Um, this was done throughout uh, various interviews, uh, various group discussions, meetings uh, online. And also it was crucial for us to ensure that there was local ownership uh, for this project. We have done so um, by uh, creating the three Mauritian diaspora survey advisory groups. These were created across the key countries. So we had one in Australia, another one in Canada and in the UK, consisting of about uh, up to eight members, uh, which uh, have had a role of activism with diaspora engagement or were leading associations abroad. Uh, these advisory groups were critical to the development of this project as well as to the success of it. And as Martin said, we are immensely thankful for their time and the contribution that they provided um, to this project. And uh, we hope to see that sort of engagement and that continuation of collaboration in the future as well. In order to get to these uh, creation of the advisory groups uh, and throughout, we have been uh, mapping different diaspora organizations abroad. Uh, so those that were more formal as well as those that were informal and that were leaning towards the digital uh, uh, networks uh, as well as those groups that we saw of alumni or various types of networks abroad. Uh, we have uh, engaged with all of these diaspora members individually or as representatives of groups. Uh, we have uh, received survey responses. We have undertaken various research interviews, as well as we held quite a bit of uh, webinars uh, with diaspora members. It is important to note that um, this research was an independent research, and we have tried to put that across throughout all of our conversations with diaspora in order for diaspora to understand that all the information that was shared with us was confidential and was used for the sole purposes of informing the recommendations that you will see here today. Uh, so uh, all the concerns, all the sensitive information that was shared with us was used only for that purpose and wasn't, uh, uh, was anonymous. The next slide uh, uh, provides some reflections before we go to the recommendations and the recommended actions. The, some reflections in terms of what we saw uh, when we analyzed the data from Mauritian diaspora. So the first point uh, uh, was that the Mauritian diaspora is gendered and generational. And uh, this is extremely important when developing diaspora engagement and when actually coming up with recommendations, because we ought to understand that mainstreaming gender in diaspora engagement is very important to Mauritian diaspora, given their values. And also the development of their home country of Mauritius is important to consider the uh, mainstreaming of gender there. So diversity as well as inclusivity uh, in terms of the diaspora is also generational. And when I say generational, that means that it involves various uh, uh, people in terms of their age, in terms of their interests. So the second and third generations, those that have not been born in Mauritius, but have a strong connection to Mauritius. We've noted that a lot of the youngsters uh, uh, that we have spoken to, but also the image of these youngsters in the eyes of uh, Mauritians that have uh, actually been in uh, abroad Mauritius for a long time, Time, was that they were very interested in the culture of Mauritius. So they uh, found that uh, they are Mauritians and that they want to be involved in the cuisine of Mauritius and the dancing and the music that was extremely important to them. So the level of the relationship that they had with Mauritius was different uh, uh, than the relationship that those that were actually born in Mauritius had it with Mauritius. So it's important to actually understand 
all these differences and to uh, have a, a notion of inclusivity when building diaspora engagement. There was a lot of concern, for instance, that we've noted throughout these research interviews uh, where Merchant diaspora that had uh, uh, that were heading organizations uh, abroad were wondering how uh, the success in, of these organizations will come to be, considering that they do not have many younger members, and how the relationship with Mauritius will evolve in the future. The next uh, reflection that we uh, considered of Mauritius diaspora was that it was very connected and committed to Mauritius. So these, uh, this is a very important notion uh, because uh, the diaspora uh, that uh, we have spoken to was definitely interesting in contributing back. And they were interested in being engaged and they considered themselves engaged with Mauritius. Nevertheless, uh, there was this strong capacity and propensity to the Mauritius diaspora. We've also noted that there were some uh, issues that were mentioned by Mauritian diaspora in terms of uh, them being uh, fragmented and not being as connected to each other. So we have spoken to a lot of them and um, across various countries. And we did not see that many of them were speaking to each other in terms of organizations in a country with another country, as well as within the same country. Uh, so it was important to understand that there's a need for this structural engagement amongst the Mauritian diaspora abroad, as well as that engagement uh, uh, to be evolved uh, with Mauritius back home. So unlocking that potential is key to developing a diaspora engagement. Uh, we have had also some um, very uh, difficult conversation in terms of the concerns that were brought to us. So some discontent and discord uh, from the Mauritian diaspora in terms of transitioning through trust and developing their voice, uh, facing the reality. Uh, but we see that as a great potential uh, in terms of understanding that the Mauritian diaspora cares about the future of the country. And that's why it raises their voice. And um, there's a strong need for a diaspora engagement platform to build a trust and a relationship that is transparent and has a win-win component to it um, in the future. And this definitely takes time. It doesn't happen right away. So all the recommendations that you will see in the next slide and the recommended action need to have this in mind in terms of the vision. Uh, the last point and the point of the ethics of care is, uh, again, something that I mentioned earlier. So the mutuality of purpose to give and to get. So uh, to have a, a strong uh, eye out for the vulnerable groups of the diaspora and for Mauritians to understand that this is a mutual beneficial relationship with diaspora. In lots of countries that we have worked in, uh, this took a while uh, uh, for various countries to understand. So initially, uh, they have spoken to diaspora abroad, asking for them to help, uh, to come back and invest to evolve the economies uh, of their home countries. Nevertheless, uh, the diaspora has come back to them saying that they we, we, we want to be involved, uh, but we also want to actually uh, benefit from this relationship. So uh, we want to uh, be part of the development of the country. We want to be shown respect and care. So this is something that uh, needs to be translated into the diaspora uh, engagement platform that is built with Mauritians abroad. The next uh, slide, as I mentioned earlier, uh, explains uh, the recommendations trends uh, that we have developed for this set of recommended actions. And um, they are cyclic, so to speak, where you see the looking uh, in at looking out and looking in in terms of the inward needs uh, that need to happen uh, for a successful diaspora engagement, but also outward what needs to happen for a successful diaspora engagement. And um, for instance, the first trend, the institutional leadership development that needs to happen for uh, Mauritius institutions in Mauritius. So uh, for the government uh, to actually enhance its capacities uh, actually talks to the inward part of it. And then strand two 
is diaspora social and cultural capital program which is exactly the outward so uh, basically the diaspora uh, involvement uh, in terms of structural and uh, collaboration that needs to happen for a successful diaspora engagement also the social and cultural uh, part of it is crucial for diaspora engagement uh, according to a lot of data that we received from surveys as well as from the research interviews uh, a culture was noted as the main area of interest uh, for diaspora members followed by heritage and welfare and then we have strength three we have diaspora human capital program uh, this uh, is also extremely important considering that a lot of the members of diaspora noted the skills transfer is something that they will be interested to actually contribute with uh, to mauritius so when asked of uh, how they would like to contribute back home skills transfer is something that a lot of them answered in terms of that they would like to provide their know-how uh, in various recommended actions Actions that we will uh, note uh, uh, later on. And then we have strand four, which is, of course, diaspora economic and capital program. And we will see a lot of recommended actions here as well. We now move to the uh, kind of final slide uh, for this particular presentation. And I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, questions about this slide in particular. We're happy to elaborate further on, but to give you a brief overview. So we have the first trend, uh, which is the leadership and institutional development trend. And the first recommended action for it is the establishment of a diaspora cell, as well as the establishment of a inter-institutional steering group on diaspora engagement. Uh, this is one of those recommended actions that have also, has already been uh, approved and uh, adapted by the government of Mauritius and is in the making. Uh, it is crucial to give diaspora engagement an institutional home. It is crucial to showcase the importance of diaspora engagement um, to the uh, government of Mauritius as uh, we, we need to consider that diaspora uh, engagement crosses many different portfolios within the government, but also uh, it includes um, private sector, media, academia, and uh, it's important to build that collaboration across these sectors uh, through, for instance, a interinstitutional sharing group that involves all of these stakeholders. The next recommended action within this trend, trend is um, the Aspera Engagement Training Program for Government of Mauritius. So the training program, uh, we believe, uh, would help in the development of the capacities of the government of Mauritius in Mauritius, but also abroad in its diplomatic missions. This is something that, of course, is very important to be able to develop and implement a successful diaspora engagement. And um, there's quite a bit of best practices uh, on what this can entail globally and examples of training programs that have been very useful and important uh, to development of a successful diaspora engagement. The third recommended action is the development of a national diaspora strategy or the first diaspora uh, strategy for Mauritius. And um, this thankfully was also adopted by the government of Mauritius and is crucial to address uh, some of the policy and uh, legislative barriers that are uh, substantial and that currently exist to engagement, unfortunately. Uh, for instance, something that was brought up quite a bit throughout our research interviews with Aspera has been uh, the voting rights uh, and uh, other points that can be addressed and uh, tackled through this diaspora strategy. I think we can now move to the second strand, uh, which is the diaspora social capital program. Uh, you will see quite a bit of recommended actions uh, that uh, we have placed here, but there's definitely room for more. Also, the titles, for instance, the Mauritius Means Campaign are just placeholder titles. So this is something that ought to be developed further, and uh, we would be happy to see a more locally owned title, for instance. So the first recommended action, the Mauritius Means Campaign, is really a public and cultural diplomacy campaign uh, so that Mauritians can engage more with councils and diplomats and 
abroad and to help the development and further strengthening of uh, diaspora networks abroad. Uh, as we said earlier, so there's a need for a cooperation amongst networks abroad, as well as their strengthening, as well as celebrating the Mauritiusness together with the diplomatic missions abroad. Uh, second, we have the recommended action of Mauritian Diaspora Leadership Network. Uh, this is again uh, extremely important as, uh, as it is important to build a tailored to build tailored networks. So various tailored networks, of, for instance, of uh, diaspora women who uh, work on uh, the empowerment of women and within the economical development back home, as well as within diaspora communities, to youth leadership networks, to uh, various professions uh, that uh, would have similar interests in collaborating with Mauritius back home, as well as amongst each other. And then we have the recommended action of the Mauritian Diaspora Summit, which brings all of this together in a way uh, for exchanging of various interests, uh, for uh, collaborating and seeing opportunities of learning from each other and of helping each other, strengthening uh, the Mauritian's cooperation. And uh, due to the pandemic, of course, this is something that would take time to organize. And uh, hopefully at one point we can organize a big summit. Uh, nevertheless, the less it is something crucial uh, in order for everyone to come together. And then we have strand three, uh, which is actually the Diaspora Human Capital Program. So we have some examples of recommended actions here, uh, considering that Mauritian's uh, uh, networks of academia have already done a lot of initiatives uh, and have already come together uh, many times. The, another recommended action that came from this trend was to develop a Mauritian Diaspora Fellows Program. So fellowships that would be possible for uh, diaspora abroad um, to actually come back for a certain period of time to Mauritius and contribute or do that remotely. It was key uh, uh, to understand that there is a lot of interest uh, for Mauritians abroad to contribute back home with their professional background. So with the skills that they have and would like to bring forward to their home country. The next recommended action is Mauritius Mentors Initiative. And uh, this is something that uh, is in line with the Diaspora Fellows uh, uh, recommended action above. Uh, so something that we considered is to develop a platform online uh, to provide remote mentorship for uh, from Mauritian diaspora to youngsters uh, of Mauritians, whether they're abroad or in Mauritius. Uh, but also there was a lot of examples from research interviews where we understood that uh, many professionals, researchers, uh, and in different fields would love to provide help to youngsters to actually enter markets abroad uh, or help them get internships abroad as well as at home uh, through their guidance. The final, the final recommended action within this trend also is the Mauritius Next Generation Camp. And this is something that a lot of Mauritian diaspora would like to see for their children. There's quite a bit of best practices uh, of uh, this particular action from different diasporas uh, in the world. So this is something that we can basically learn from and replicate for Mauritius. And then we have the final strand and the recommended actions within the Diaspora Economic Capital Program. So we have the Mauritian Diaspora Tourism Initiative. And of course, uh, tourism for uh, Mauritian is extremely important. And it uh, could be this initiative particularly could be an open invitation to diaspora for a certain period of time for them to come back and try to build uh, incentives for them to come back, but also uh, for them to be part of a uh, basically um, maybe strategical target, uh, targeting second and third generations to further strengthen their connection with Mauritius. We have also heard uh, quite a bit about the cost to travel to Mauritius as an issue that maybe needs uh, and can be addressed through this initiative as well. Then we have the Mauritius Diaspora Trust Fund. Um, so this is something that uh, needs time to be developed, of course. Uh, so it needs a very strong leadership from uh, a diaspora, from Mauritian diaspora. And there, uh, there's a need for a very strong structural uh, network and framework of diaspora abroad in order to implement this. 
It is also important to note that uh, when it comes to the investment journey, according to the data that we have gathered, we see that um, diaspora investment journey is probably in the mid to long term rather than in the short to mid term at the moment. And uh, diaspora is mostly interested in philanthropic giving and uh, social development at this point. And then we see the final uh, recommended action, which is Mauritius Diaspora Business Competition. So there's a lot of uh, uh, businesses that are already uh, engaging and working in Mauritius uh, from abroad, as well as different businesses in Mauritius that engage with diaspora, uh, considering we live at a global age. So this is, of course, uh, something that is already happening. It is important to acknowledge that and praise that collaboration. So it's important to actually uh, have have competitions uh, that will encourage further collaboration of businesses from Mauritius with abroad, as well as businesses abroad of uh, diaspora, merchant diaspora that actually are engaging with Mauritius back home. Um, there's a uh, quite a bit of uh, examples on this point as well, but I think that um, this will provide all of you with a framework of the recommendations that uh, you can see in the report that will be published very soon for everyone to, uh, to, to read through. And these are just some of the recommended actions. So it's very important for us to get a uh, general feedback from you today, but also to hear more examples, more suggestions of what actually works for you and what is important to the merchant diaspora. And on that note, uh, I, I come back to the same point uh, mentioned by all of us. Please engage, please write your suggestions, comments on Facebook or in the platform here. We're more than happy to answer that. I want to finish this presentation on a note of thank you, of course. So we are immensely, immensely thankful to the advisory groups in Australia, Canada, and the UK. This could not have been possible without their help. And we, of course, are also thankful to the Mauritian diaspora in general and the individuals that have stepped up to help us with the outreach and uh, with uh, understanding uh, what uh, are the needs and aims of Mauritian diaspora. And a special thanks goes to the team of IOM, to everyone that has been engaged throughout, and especially to uh, Tanya, who is now on the call and who has done a, an incredible job with coordinating everything and with helping us actually undertake this research, myself and Martin. So thank you again very much. Uh, I think after this presentation, uh, we would like to invite our advisory, our incredible advisory uh, members uh, from uh, respectively Canada and the UK to share with us their research journey, but also to provide some reflections on these recommendations. I uh, think I can go ahead with inviting uh, Sheev from Canada to say a few words after I stop uh, the screen sharing. and. Um, uh, Shiv, uh, if you're available, please go ahead and share with us uh, your your insights. And thank you again for all the support throughout. Okay, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can, Shiv. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shiv Sichan. I'm from uh, Canada. I firstly I start by thanking IOM, mainly my good friends now, Martin, Emira. Tanya in Mauritius and Selin also. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk. Also prior to that, thank me to uh, thank you to give me the opportunity to work together with uh, IOM. Uh, many of the aims and objectives of uh, IOM have been my uh, my dreams on how to bridge Mauritius with uh, Canada and the diaspora around the whole world. <clears throat> So thank you, the, the team. What I plan to talk about today is to share some of the community work that I have been doing here in Canada for the past 15 years now. And uh, the intention is not to brag. The intention is not to say, I did this, I did that. No. The intention is to motivate people here in Canada, other people, other diaspora in Canada and around the world also, how we can work together as a com community. I know it's very, very, very challenging. And then I will talk about the expectation of the diaspora here in, in Canada and most likely around the world. And some of my thoughts on how we can work together in the short, medium and the long, long term. So I started here, uh, I, 
I came in Canada 20 years back. Uh, and, uh, you know, like everyone, we just start a good living around you know, through all the difficulties and all. But because of my past passion of uh, doing community work, I did quite some in Mauritius and uh, in Sheshal. I was in Sheshal for seven years and I was in India also. For the, uh, that passion sort of uh, gave me some dynamism to sort of create or to set up a Mauritian community here in the west side of the GTA, the Greater Toronto area. So. We among friends together, we sat down and we created uh, a not-for-profit organization that we call Dudu Canada. Well, Dudu Canada has been here for quite a long time. Uh, I think since about 2006, we developed, we grew up, we digitized, we did quite a lot of activities. Yes, like many, many uh, organizations and group uh, grouping the Mauritians during events like the Independence Day, end of the year, or during summertime, uh, we just mostly, honestly, we just meet around, we have some dinner, we have some dance, we have some fun together, and that's, that's it. So I call it as a dinner dance, which is good. Many people come in, many people come in for the dance that uh, the organization will set up uh, the entertainment. But the vision of Dodo Canada was beyond the dinner dance. It was beyond that. Let's do something different. Let's get involved in the com community. Let's do something that is real, uh, has effects, and uh, we can leave the footprints around. And Dodo Canada, we did the, the food the food drive, you know, the food the food banks. People can come and donate food and we go give it to the needy people. There's a system well well set up. We did the food food drive. It worked quite well for some time. And then another good project we did was the blood donation. It was so nice that during weekend we set up with the blood system of uh, Canada and a lot of uh, Mauritian community people, they came and we did that blood donation for quite a while. Another good project we did was the tax, the volunteer tax, where, where people who are not uh, versatile, people who are not nor knowledgeable, people who cannot afford to file the, their taxes, we go through a system, we get trained, and then we offer that service on a volunteer basis. And we did that for quite some time. And uh, we had to just uh, book the room in a community hall, and we invite those people who would need the services, they would come and we develop the teams to do that. So, and uh, as and when time passed by, the system evolved and uh, groups of friends uh, we met, we regionalized uh, and thanks to some people at the Toronto City Hall and thanks to the count councillor, we, uh, we developed the Mauritius flag raising. It was the first time that uh, in Toronto, about six years back at the city hall, we did the flag raising where at one time we had about 750 Mauritian community people coming for those events. I would correct over here that it was not the first time that we did flag raising in Toronto ever in Canada, because in Brandon, Manitoba, a group of Mauritian friends, they had done that prior to, to us. So uh, people will be watching this issue. That's not correct. Toronto did not do the first time. It was Brandon who did the first time. Another good thing that um, as part of the flag raising, um, we connected, I personally, at one occasion, approached the mayor of, of Toronto, and I requested him to declare the 12th of March as the Mauritius Cultural Day. And after a lot of uh, communication, meetings, telephone calls, uh, the city of Toronto agreed to declare the 12th March as Mauritius 
cul cultural day and heritage uh, mauritius is very proud to have uh, achieved uh, such a milestone among the mauritian community and when you go at the city hall you see that on 12th of march it is returned this day is for mauritius cul cultural day so these uh, are some of the good achievements we have done to get together and uh, i uh, always encourage people that uh, to do a lot of uh, community work uh, beyond those good dinner dance, which I myself, I entertain myself well, but it's fine. Also, in the, at Heritage Mauritius, I must say that uh, I was one of the key persons to empower other people, other members, other community people to, to come in the front and take the leader, leadership role. And I'm proud to say that uh, we have been able to bring in uh, Yogita, who is a woman, to be the leader of uh, Heritage uh, Mauritius. This is a big achievement to bringing women in the front line to take leads. And we have good friends like Noshad, who has developed his leader leadership and com uh, communication skills. And we have on the west side, we have uh, Shushila, who most likely is listening over here. And we have a lot of friends around. I'm, I, I may be missing names around Vela, Neet, everyone they have worked together to come in the front line so the community work has also given the opportunity to develop the leadership and the interpersonal skills among the groups of Mauritian with whom we have worked and there are a lot much more that we can do so I come to the parts of the expectation the expectation of the diaspora in Mauritius I keep on the, the other thing we had talked about, the number of Mauritians outside Mauritius, I know the figure came to about, I read, 190,000, close to about, but my uh, figures are uh, much more than that. I believe there are over 500,000 Mauritians outside Mauritius. And coming back in, in Canada, we have about 35 to 37,000 Mauritians around here. So the expectation of this diaspora, I have been able to travel. I have traveled to several place, places during this Mauritian community organization. There are about close to six to eight Mauritian organization active ones. I've been to Mon Montreal, Ottawa. I've been to Brandon, Manitoba, Winnipeg. I've been to Edmonton. I've been to Cal Calgary, maybe Van Vancouver soon. So the expectation of many of the community organization le leaders and the Mauritian people is how we can bridge the Mauritians in Canada with Mauritius. There are lots of good ideas coming. We want to link. Yes, giving back is good. Giving back is good. I personally, I had I have a project of bridging education when we where we give uh, supplies and other aids to the Mauritian needy students. I have a similar project in Madagascar also. Now, the expectation of the Mauritian dias diaspora is to see a better Mauritius. You see a better Mauritius for the Mauritian people who are there. And we see a better Mauritius for the diaspora who is outside Mauritius and who would like to have a linkage with Mauritius and who would like to some of them would like to retire back in Mauritius. I have the, in my list some of the retirement schemes that uh, Mauritius can develop and put for, forward for the diaspora around the world. Uh, another point is some of the investment scheme. I heard from Emira, I read that from Emira, they, they, have, they have proposed well. What I will suggest going beyond the investment scheme where India has a similar project for attracting investment from the NRI, they call that non-resident Indians. So what they do is that they have uh, special pro programs, special schemes in the banking sector where the non-resident Indians can open bank account at a premium return of investment. I personally have that one in my, because my grandparents are from India and I am someone who is the NRI or the OCI that they call it now. And then you can have investment accounts with the premium return. So that would attract the Mauritian diaspora around the world to invest in Mauritius where they will get premium 
a return on their investment. Another good bit of my suggestion would be, I'm talking about the expectation of the, dias the diaspora. Uh, another thing is that uh, the mostly, mostly the second generation of the, dia of the diaspora who one, either mom or dad who have been born in Mauritius, they are eligible for a, citizen, for a citizenship of Mauritius, among the other criteria, right? So either parent who is born in Mauritius at the time of birth, the child, whatever age, anywhere in the world can apply to become a citizenship of Mauritius, fine. But how about the third generation? How about the fourth generation? They will not uh, they are not eligible. So Mauritius should, uh, I, will, I will propose for Mauritius to develop under uh, their citizenship act on how to attract the diaspora second, third, fourth gen uh, generation to apply for a citizenship of Mauritius or a similar project that India has that they call it the NRI or the o OCI. Another I heard uh, in the last uh, one or two uh, webinars that Mauritius is developing the tourism, attracting those tourism, the, the diaspora to come. It is fine. I think Mauritius, not I think, there, there is a project where Mauritians can go to Rodrigues Island at a promo low cost. Uh, that uh, but the, cri the criteria is that you book your air ticket and your hotel at the same time. Means that the island, the small island of Rod Rodrigue, will get business over there. Similarly, we use the similar uh, model that they are using for Rod and Rodrigue. You do the same model for around the world, the Mauritian diaspora who would want to come to Mauritius if they book uh, hotels and the other leisure activities that are around there. So Air Mauritius and other stakeholders, they can develop a promo type of a scheme which will attract the Mauritian to go to Mauritius at a low cost. Believe me, it is not easy for a family of three, four, five to go to Mauritius, spend over 10, 12, 15 thousand dollars for a vacation. Where away from the North America, we can go to Cuba, you spend less than one thousand dollars, all paid for seven days. So Mauritius should sort of open their eyes, the board of investment, the airline industry, the hotel industry, they all should up, they should sort of come up together and uh, in that uh, in that external affairs uh, Mauritius diaspora cell sit down and how to promote this thing so these are some of the projects that I uh, mentioned how Mauritius can attract uh, the, dias the diaspora to invest in Mauritius I myself I'm going to share with the, my friends who are listening and watching me now there are ways that we can make proposal other than IOM uh, acting as a broker or the Mauritius uh, external affairs cell that they will create. There are ways that we can make good propo uh, proposal. There's no need to go to demonst demonstration, all this time of BLDs and all this type of stuff. No, there are good ways of doing the nice proposal. You know, the budget is coming. So we can write the Mauritian organization, all this community organization, you can write to the Ministry of Finance and make some prop uh, proposals. Like I myself, I'm going to make the proposal of that investment account that I talked about. And right now the returning residents, they are allowed certain uh, bene uh, benefits. And that benefits, uh, it is a couple, they give only one person who is allowed those benefits. So I'm going to write and propose to them, no, give the benefits to both spou spouses and why not to the second and the third gen generation. There's a ways to make those proposals and uh, we keep on if uh, now we have uh, Australia, we have Europe, we have Canada, we can all together sit down and make very good proposal. And then there are uh, some of the good things, uh, some of the other points that I've been always talk talking is um, we here in uh, Canada, we can sort of work together with the embassy to make a lot of good projects happen. So my expectation is that we work together 
to make good things happen. And I'm sure in future, uh, the, the momentum is there and in future we can do a lot of work together. And having said that, uh, yes, I heard about the mentorship pro program. Yes, I heard about the exchange pro pro program. We are here together. We can make those uh, happen. So voila, thank you very much. I do appreciate the time given to me to share my thoughts and some or a lot of thoughts are from my my friends around and uh, let's do it in a right ways in a, you know, you have, there's a protocol, there's a system that we will have to follow, like it or not, this is the ways, whatever colors that they belong to, that's the ways, but there's a way, a system to, to follow. So thank you so uh, much. Merci thank beaucoup, you, all my good friends, uh, merci. And uh, I can sort of, if there are any questions, if there's anything now or even at a later time after this webinar. We thank you, do. Shiv. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Shiv. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, thank you for all your help to date with the project, uh, with the outreach. Uh, thank you for a very well elaborated uh, present speaking today, but also for all the suggestions that you elaborated and for all your thoughts. We are very appreciative of that, as well as uh, for sharing the thoughts of your immersion friends abroad. Uh, we strongly uh, encourage everyone to actually uh, share their views uh, today on Facebook or on the platform here. Uh, to, to address some of the points that you mentioned or some of the suggestions that you mentioned, uh, they definitely can all fall into the framework that was presented today, I believe, and they're very good suggestions. Uh, India uh, is a country with a lot of best practices on how to engage its diaspora. Uh, there are definitely quite a bit of uh, winner actions that uh, India has been taking, and uh, this is something to learn from. Why not? Uh, it's um, always good to see uh, best examples and just replicate them. There's no, no shame in that. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for bringing them up. I believe uh, Air Mauritius and some of the stakeholders that you mentioned are thankfully already part of the steering uh, technical working group that I mentioned as part of the first recommended action within the institutional leadership development. So this is something that can be addressed uh, uh, throughout uh, in terms of tourism. And uh, uh, again, there's quite a bit of points that I think are very helpful that you suggested and could actually fall into the framework of the recommendations that we mentioned. Uh, Martin, is there anything you would like to add or uh, Tanya, uh, before we move forward to the next speaker? No, I, I just personally want to thank Sheev. I know I think Sheev, the first time we spoke, it may have been a Sunday as well, if, if my memory serves me right. And we had a good open and long conversation and we, we got around to that. But I, I want to just commend Sheev and his colleagues on, on the work that they've been doing and similar to people around the world. And I, I'll leave you with this line for now, which is something that a very dear friend of mine who was involved in the setting up of what's now a very big diaspora organization. And the line he says, always remember that nobody ever created a big company. Everything starts at zero. Yeah. So if we think about where, where the community is, and there might be people on this call that are thinking about getting engaged. So I think, you know, your own story has shown how starting from zero has grown and grown and grown and the community is benef benefiting as, as a result of that. So my message is just to keep going, <laughs> you know, keep, keep being as passionate as you are. I think if you could bottle your passion for Mauritius, we'd all be very wealthy people <laughs> because we'd be able, to, be able to, to, to export it globally. But look, I just want to thank you for everything that you've done. And I'm conscious of time, so I'll be quiet now and we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, Tanya, is there anything you want to uh, add or should we move ahead? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I really want to thank Xi for all the support he's been he's been uh, giving us for the project, but also uh, as Martin highlighted, like we can we can hear the passion and enthusiasm to related to Mauritius. So we look forward to uh, continue this dialogue with you and implement all these ideas. I think you have great ideas. So uh, yes, thank you again. Thank you very much. 
Thanks again, and thanks uh, to everyone watching on Facebook as well as uh, here in the Zoom platform. We have a lot of uh, thank you uh, comments and uh, hellos from Canada, I believe from Edmonton, from Pay. Uh, so that's uh, great to see. Uh, please send your questions, suggestions to us through Facebook or here in Zoom at the Q&A box. Next, we move to our uh, wonderful colleague from UK, Yashoda, to actually share her journey uh, of the research with us with in the advisory group, but also uh, her feedback on the recommendations. The floor is yours, Yashoda. Thank you. Thank you, Emira. So good evening, everyone. Uh, hello to Martin, uh, Shiv, and uh, Tanya, and uh, Tanvi, and all everybody who's watching me right now on Zoom and Facebook Live as well. So well, for me, I've been involved in the IOM Motion Diaspora project through the HICOM of Mauritius here in London. And the research journey was enriching and pleasant as Dr. Martin, Martin, of course, gave us the right platform to express ourselves, discuss our views and concerns as Mauritians living miles away from home. I personally reached out to my Mauritian friends residing in the UK, engaging with them to respond to the survey, uh, promoting uh, some of the posts of the uh, IOM uh, group on Facebook. And uh, as well, this project allowed me to focus, to think on the ways on how to continue uh, helping Mauritius and the community abroad. And I had the chance to intervene at the first session of the webinars last November on how the Mauritian community abroad are helping Mauritius at each time of a crisis. And even now, people are still like um, debating about, you know, what is going on around the world with all the vaccine rollout. So this is where, you know, skills transfer, know-how comes into play. And as well, that passion and the strong voice of the Mauritian community uh, from here to Mauritius. And um, the setting up of the advisory group has been one of the major features of the project as it acts as the think tank for the project. And it gives us a platform to discuss and to give feedback on that's where all the recommendations that have been presented today uh, as came from. As the think tank for the project. So I guess she... And Shiv, can I ask you to turn uh, yeah. off your audio? Yeah. Yeah. Thank Stop. you. It's okay. Thank you. So yeah, so this is where the recommendations are taking the shape and all the advisory groups from Australia, UK and Canada have to come into play and so that everything, uh, you know, work together. And for me, I'm glad that all the recommendations that we mentioned, everything, is now written down and has been approved by the Mauritian government so that we can start doing it. Um, have, uh, have like my small concerns, of course, about the logistics, how do we make it work, who will be the person to coordinate and the motivation and expected effort that we want to achieve. Uh, definitely the aim for the future is on the current and future conditions on how the world is operating right now. So we should like start with short medium to long-term plans. And I believe that each milestone um, defined will take its time to reach and the well-defined strategy to be followed. I strongly believe that we should have like a transparent, you know, communication mechanism to be established between the government of mergers and the several advisory uh, groups around the world for proper communication and engagement. I had the same level of enthusiasm since October, start of the journey now and for the future years to come to achieve all those recommendations and continuously improve as well. I also believe that uh, connectivity, visibility should be a key parts of the mission to encourage Mauritian abroad to be part of it and also to show the Mauritians living immersion emerges to see what is happening so we need to have like this kind of, you know, uh, both sides, uh, we understand each other and definitely use our embassies around the world offices. So we have like more uh, connection with the people. 
I also understand that we have like different time zones and we are not able to meet each other to, to discuss, but we need to create like a platform where like the key members of this advisory uh, group to meet and also to share the ideas with uh, IOM in between to, to come and also who will come from Mauritius to talk to us. So we need to create that dedicated space. Um, I also wanted to mention about that, yes, we talk about these four segments of the recommendation and we need to identify the right people uh, to come and support each one of them, those categories, the subcommittees, and how also we, us, to be trained and uh, not only with uh, IOM, but also with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to understand as well some diplomatic agreements, legislation, policies uh, that we ought to amend to allow the diaspora cell to work. As we mentioned earlier about our voting rights, for instance. And also the next observation that I would like to make is about sustainability of the project. Definitely next generation is one thing. And I support with what uh, she just mentioned about, you know, all the schemes about uh, first, second to fourth and, and so on, how do we support them? And also we need to also um, take into consideration that uh, us, we are born in Mauritius, our children will be born here. And also what about our partners? How do they also get benefits? How do we encourage them to be part of this journey? This is one thing. And how do we keep our next generation engage with the future generation of Mauritians, uh, like, you know, to bridge the gaps between them. I understand that we do enjoy the food, the cuisine, the entertainment, but more than that, it's not just about, you know, the uh, bright side of this, the sea, sun, beach stuff, but also about, you know, policy making. how do we help in the progress of, of the island? It's just not entertainment, I mean, Everybody will travel, we like to have definitely uh, exotic destination to go on, but we need to help the country uh, be with the policymakers so that we can also, you know, be as watch, uh, watching what they are doing, having like the, uh, to see what, um, you know, the welfare state is being maintained and how our investment is being uh, used over there. I also understand that this is a very challenging mission for everyone and it will take time. And this is the next level of change that we are looking forward to. Um, continuous engagement with the community to understand the needs and concern, appropriate audit mechanisms to be in place to maintain the integrity of the project and proper communication lines to be established to stop and achieve the recommendations. And I mean, all that you said earlier, Mira, in your in the presentation is, and also what Chief mentioned is what we wanted is actually becoming a reality. So as for me, I guess um, I'll call myself a third generation, grandfather, mother, family, third generation. Uh, and I came here in a new country and but I still maintain and I keep promoting my rules so that should be also um, something that we need to continuously do and engage people um, I don't know uh, it depends thank how you so much do, uh, yes how we, we proceed the time frame that uh, we have uh, to do it like short term what can we do in the next five years or within the next two years right now. But like for the UK, I, I know that in July, we are having the Mauritian festival. It's like, you know, the big uh, meetup for all Mauritians to come and enjoy some music, food, and, and basically entertainment. But what's next? So, I mean, uh, when are we going to start the recommendation? When are we going to do like action to, to, to pen it down and to show, uh, you know, to see concrete action. It just, yes, they can approve, but for how long? We need like a time. We need to have like a duration to, to establish, okay, this one, first level, second level, sub activities, or can we do like something in parallel? 
or like the fellowship one, uh, we already have a uh, University of Mauritius and the other university in Mauritius that are there. People from here, alumni association can be helping from here to there. So stuff like, you know, small actions till we go up to, you know, the end. And I know like changing legislation and policies definitely take time. And um, also how do we um, have the respect and care that we're looking for from our own fellows, why we are saying that we want to do this to you for the community over there, whether it will be accepted, which people are we going to address the concerns, who will be the ones to moderate it. So it's a bit like, it's good to have everything listed down then we can say and select and also to have the right people at the right place to do the job. Uh, are we going to proceed with interviews? Who will be the ones to do it? Um, even the advisory group, how are we going to meet? So I have all these concerns right now. Thank you so much, Hesola. Thank you so much. And for... also I would like to, to thank everyone who helped the IOM Dust for our survey and every one of you who helped us to achieve as you say, that we have strong voices, we are passionate, we care for the home country, and this is who we are, people from Mauritius. So thank you, everyone. And I hope to have like continued support from, from everyone who's watching us right now. If ever I missed something, just send it into the comments, send it to us on our Facebook, and we can take it forward for those advisory groups and we can discuss it and turn it down so that the government can read it. And um, yeah, so I, I will just say once again, thank you IOM and also the High Commission of Mauritius to give me the chance to speak and to serve my country even being miles away. And I will continue to do so. Long live Mauritius. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yashoda. You raise uh, so many important points and we're immensely thankful. And also you ask the right questions actually, and that's extremely important. And as you said, uh, strong voices are always something that are welcome and they actually trigger change. So they are very important. Uh, you mentioned transparency, which is extremely important. And uh, it was something that we drove this project uh, based upon. Uh, so uh, we we have tried to actually be transparent throughout all of the activities and uh, these webinars, the three webinars that we organize are also another way of us uh, trying to engage with diaspora with the recommendations uh, that we have uh, the framework upon so that we get the feedback and so that the Mauritian diaspora is involved throughout all of the steps of the project. Um, Again, uh, you mentioned also a lot of other points which are extremely important. I think a lot of uh, the comments of what to do first and what to do next and whether to do things in parallel is very valid. And also it's kind of part of the strengths that we presented. And I feel that definitely there is no need to wait for one step to get to the other. Uh, so there's a, a continuation of a logical sort of a framework to get from one to the other, but there's a lot of activities that can be done together uh, with a lot of uh, collaboration from the diaspora, but also with Mauritius back home. Uh, I, I will ask Martin and uh, again, Tanya, if they have any comments, but also in the meantime, let me once again, thank everyone for uh, being here on Facebook and Zoom. And um, please do ask questions. So I think we have some questions, but please go ahead and provide your suggestions and comments. Uh, and uh, if we don't answer them here today, also, you can write to us. And uh, I think I posted a link in the very beginning. I'll post it again. It's a link uh, for you to be able to schedule a time to speak to us separately. Uh, so you can do that later on if you have further suggestions. So please go ahead and do that uh, booking. Um, the idea for these webinars was also to have the advisory members of different uh, countries talk to each other. Uh, so we hope to have uh, similar events later on in the future. Uh, Martin, is there anything uh, you would like to add? No, it was incredible. I look just at a personal reflection. When I remember the first time I spoke to you, Shola, she was again very gracious with her time, but I remember texting her very quickly after saying, Your passion shone true in, in the call. And I think it very much did there. You know, and look, I think you, you, you correctly outline in many ways much of the, the, the nuts and bolts 
of, of what will need to be considered to make sure that this actually comes to fruition and comes to reality. So I think you can rest assured, just to pick up on a couple of those to maybe for the audience as well. When you see the wider report, we address those issues of governance and we address them in quite deep, quite, quite detail, quite a lot of detail. So, so rest assured that that's covered. And I think we're, we're in the process now of developing the action plan to, to really build almost the, the micro, microscopic steps to make these a reality. And I, I want to provide a line that maybe it's an old Irish line, but, but it's a good one, I think, you know, in the sense of when we think about this second generation and third generation or fourth generation, and even though this is on Facebook, I'm an, I know I'm amongst friends, so don't quote me on this. <laughs> in many ways, I remember sitting down with an Irish diplomat about five, six years ago at an event, and I said, this, this issue of, you know, who are the diaspora? How, how do we define them? And he leaned in with a little wink and he said, don't overthink it. He said, if, if you feel Irish, you are Irish. And I think, you know, when you mentioned that point as well about third generation or fourth generation, that will have the lineage line to Mauritius. But when you mention partners, for example, there's really interesting ideas such as affinity diasporas. And what's really interesting is that I can tell you hundreds of stories from many different countries, but I can, I can tell you one very quickly from my country, if you wish, how often the husband or wife of somebody from the country is actually more passionate about the country <laughs> than, than the person that's from it. And I, I, look, I can tell you one philanthropic story that left an incredible mark on the development of education in this, on, the, on my little island that came from the spouse of an Irish diaspora, that diaspora member who was not Irish. So let's make sure that we keep that sense of, you know, never undervalue the power of a love story <laughs> and, and where that can go in terms of diaspora engagement. So from my end, look, I, I think you, you, you bring out the, the, the key issues of, of how we now structurally go about this. And that's where we are. And I think that's a nice point to relay back to Tanya, because I know she may want to share some information on a project that they have coming up, but obviously, you're on the front line working in Mauritius on this. So I don't want to speak on behalf of IOM. So I think she can give you a quick update in terms of, you know, those wider structural questions or issues. So Tanya, the floor is yours. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, Yashida, uh, for, for this. So I think you mentioned a lot of important points and one of those were on the implementation. So Martin and Emira, um, uh, I would join them on saying like we're working actually on this action plan so we make all these recommendation easier to implement and as for the dedicated space where we could work together so as part of this project uh, there was a diaspora cell that was supposed to be set up at the level of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs but due to the pandemic unfortunately this was delayed but we hope to be support we will be supporting the government uh, in setting this up which would be a platform where we could centralize all diaspora initiatives and uh, in the meantime we keep working as uh, I think we said as a bridge or a broker to on this uh, and provide a platform but uh, we also have a project in the pipeline in regards to youth diaspora a youth diaspora volunteer program uh, which will start, I think, this year, where we hope to engage young diaspora members to come to Mauritius to volunteer in certain areas and sectors identified and uh, connect with the cultural roots. And, and yes, so we also look forward to working with you on that and welcome all your inputs. So thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect. Th thank you, Tanya. And I just want to as, as I was just, just reflecting on what you showed and Shiv said, I think, I think both of you touched on a topic that's incredibly important for, for the long-term sustainability of this as well. And behind it all, hopefully when you see the recommendations and, and the action plans behind them, having really strong diaspora leadership and, and having that networked and connected with each other. You know, when we talk about some of the initiatives in this, and the bigger question here is what is the role of government? That's essentially what we're asking on, on many levels. And if we talk about the role of government as one of a facilitator or an implementer, there's definitely recommendations to my, my humble view within what Amira has presented where the diaspora can take this up and lead on it on their own. You know, they can, they can work in collaboration with government maybe, but it can come from the diaspora. And I think that was speaking to where, to where she was as well in terms of, you know, engaging and giving voice back and giving ideas back. So we want to see that culture of diaspora leadership get stronger and, and elevate in Mauritius. And I think... You know, part of it is what's interesting as well for us in the research was that the diasporas in the three countries were at different stages of their own development. 
So there's even a lot of knowledge about, you know, how do we actually go about that if we just connect all those people. So I just wanted to bring that up because I think, you know, just a reflection from working globally on the topic as well. The more that you have those exemplary leaders that are really stepping up to the plate and I'm wanting to commit. And the beauty of what this research has proven to us is that those people are there for Mauritius. It's a, it's a much more difficult job if the people are not there <laughs> to go do it. So the fact that you have them in the diaspora, it's just about connecting them. And look, for want of a better phrase, you kind of let them loose to create <laughs> you know, and, and, and see what they come back with. So I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time and we're kind of pushing on in time a little bit. I think you showed a particularly and Shiv's presentation picked up on some of the questions that we got in advance. So I don't want to rehash those, you know, but those questions of governance, the, the action plan for this and the timeline of that. Just quickly on that for people that haven't joined the previous webinars, what the research report really looks to is arguing that everybody across the, the, the landscape of Mauritius, not just government, not just the diaspora, but the public sector and civil society and everybody involved needs to commit to a long-term vision in terms of diaspora engagement. This is not a quick win. You know, there, there, this is not something that you turn the light switch on and, and, it, and it happens. So what we presented here, we would see that as, as arguably a five-year body of work that will be the first building block in a wider 15 to 20 year vision. So I think it's about really articulating that. And I think that's where the strategy, for example, the national diaspora strategy will come in because that's where you articulate those type of ambitions, the visions, the aims and, and things like that. So the other key question that we got in advance was about mainstreaming gender and youth. And I think you, you can see that across the initiatives, particularly in the Mauritian diaspora leadership network, we can create a women's leadership network in the diaspora. We can create a next generation leadership network. Same with the mentorship and, and as Tanya's project, the upcoming project mentions, is something that the IOM is very cognizant of. And I think the, the other key question, as I say, was how does this actually benefit the diaspora? And what I would say to that very quickly is that if you really look at strand one and strand two, particularly of the recommendations, this comes back to that, that idea of diaspora leadership and, and how do we support them, support them through platforms and connectivity, but also through investment in, in the type of organizations they're trying to run. Because what was interesting for us is that you have a really interesting landscape of diaspora networks and organizations that work. Some are really established and, you know, run as very formal, functional uh, nonprofit organizations. Some are more informal, such as Facebook groups and, you know, alumni networks or young student networks. So the question is, how do we actually support them? So, so there were the main questions. I'll hand back to Amira in case there's any immediate questions. Have I missed anything or is there anything from Facebook that I need to be speaking to before I get myself into trouble? Amira, anything else? Sorry, Martin, took me a while to unmute. <laughs> uh, thank you again uh, to all that are watching on Facebook and here. So I think there's a few comments on Facebook uh, of praise mostly, and there are a few comments from Hans. I think he's been um, uh, saying that we need to reach out to him as well. Um, and that's definitely something that we can do. I posted also the link uh, for you to book a meeting with us on Facebook. So please go ahead and do that uh, if you have further comments and suggestions. Um, Hans is saying that there are so many meetings of diaspora groups and he wants to understand our motives. And if we are collaborating with the government. Um, so maybe that's something, Martin, that uh, you can answer quickly. I think we've mentioned it also throughout the presentation. Yeah, of course. So in, in the context of, of this project, as I said from the very beginning, it's an independent research project. So all the data that was produced was just for the purpose of the researchers only. So obviously the recommendations would go to hopefully informing government decisions and government policies, but the research process was, was very independent. I, I can maybe kind of defer to Tanya if she'd like to speak about IOM's wider work in, in terms of, of with the government, but but this this for the purposes of this research, it was very independent, solely independent. So hopefully that helps answer the, answer the question. Yes, uh, I can add to that. So as part of this project, uh, I think we mentioned it earlier in the in the previous sessions as well. We we work with a technical working group, where so people from different ministries, uh, academia, private sector as well, uh, to implement this project. So these people, the the these institutions and stakeholders are key for the implementation of these recommendations that we're trying to put forward. So we work together. But as Martin said, uh, this research was done uh, independently. So everything, every information that was collected was collected within our IOM uh, 
data collection procedures. So uh, just to reassure everyone to assure that this was done independently, independently, but we do work with the uh, with the uh, different stakeholders to implement this project. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. So look, I think we've we've come to the kind of the end in terms of the next steps. People are clear in a sense of we now develop an action plan. So please book the meeting, share comments, engage with us, email us, hound us. You know, we're happy to be hounded in many ways. So look, just a very quick thank you from my end to begin. And I want to begin to thank you with, with Sheev, Yashoda, and all the team that were involved in the advisory group. But most importantly, I think as Yashoda said as well, everybody that took the time to actually fill out. The, the form and get involved with the project. I think the, the number in general is, is very uh, competitive and on the higher end of what is achieved in terms of diaspora projects. <laughs> so that, that's a good sign. I think it shows that if you give the diaspora a bit of leadership and a bit of ownership, and I see Sheev smiling. I remember Sheev and I having a bit of a little bit of a collective troublemaker conversation once and I said, let's make it a bit competitive. <laughs> so we see who finishes top of the leaderboard in terms of Canada, Australia and the UK. But, but genuinely, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure from, from my end to learn about what, where you're from, to learn about the community, to listen to the community. And our very simple aim in this research was to produce something that would hopefully help Mauritius, but, but also help the diaspora. So hopefully when you see the final report and you see the executive summary, you, you can see that that has been, been achieved. I think Yashoda has the hand raised, hand raised, so I'll quickly go back to her if there's anything to add. that. Yes, so I would just like to add on uh to to what we are all saying so first of all there's no competition between uh the diasporas and, and and advisory groups so the aim is mauritius okay the benefits and the welfare of mauritius i know the canadian uh group is very very much more uh, connected and active as well as one in australia because i guess they have the support of their government over there because i've seen um actions on facebook on how you know bridge places where the, even the flags were hoisted uh, when we had our Independence Day. But unfortunately, here in London, there was nothing happening. That was a bit sad in the sense that you know here, um, not even like lighting something for us. So I guess maybe we should take this uh, up with uh, the UK advisory group and how we can get in touch with the High Commission of of mergers here in London to do this kind of action. This is very good because um, CNN gave us coverage for like those 10 seconds uh, that they have for adverts for different countries. So whenever I tune into CNN, I can see sometime like the moment of calmness, portly. So actually they show like um, a, a beach as well as the sister island, Rodrigues. So I'm hoping that maybe we should work something with the BBC and other news channel to do just like have those 10 five seconds of showing Mauritius the landscape and and you know to have that the culture week uh during our independence something like that so I know uh based on my previous employment in Mauritius we've been promoting uh products and services and you could do it through um the EDB and they have their representative across the globe so you can send also your suggestions to them because they also have a big part to play when they do the budget draft and etc so this is one thing and also how they promote their semiculture around the world so i've been involved in those kind of activities that's why um i was willing to continue doing that um so one thing yeah i know uh, i've seen the comments on facebook but it's just not about you know who is doing the thing right now? We should just not think now, but the next 10, five years, because people change, uh, situations change, because like, see, who would knew that we, everybody would be in state of lockdown right now, just one year ago? Nobody. So we need now to adapt as well on how to are promoting ourselves and how we can um, encourage people to visit the island when everything is back to normal, well, normal between, you know, um, new normal. Uh, so, and also how us advisory groups, so we've shaved with the Australian people on how we are going to meet because I've, I'm, I, I was unable to connect like yesterday morning, I missed the alarm for six o'clock in the morning, five o'clock. So I guess maybe on Sunday we, sh we should like have like a working group so we can have like uh, three different sessions, we can join in like that so we can have like some interactions and I know there's 
too many groups on Facebook uh, with the other countries, the European side of the diaspora is also very much active and they have been um, very, very important in this, in when we had the crisis last year. They even stood in front of the, you know, they were in, in Paris, in, in, in Geneva, in Belgium, Luxembourg, and I mean, I have the friends over there. So we also need to think about the European side of the diaspora um, and everywhere else. So I guess well, with the census that we are doing, I guess we have like 200,000 Mauritian living outside the country and 40,000 around each in the UK right now. Well, I don't know. Uh, I know the data will be updated. So we need just to keep up to, to date uh, with our community, how many people are there, and how are we going to reach them? So I'm looking forward to continuously work with the IOM and with you guys uh, to take this, you know, to put it into shape. Thank you. Can I say something? Yeah, please, please. Shoot. Okay. Uh, it's not competing. I want to correct that thing. It's not competing with each other. No. The competition was sort of in a good way to sort of who we, which con country will get the most number of interviews, which country will get the most number of sur surveys. So it was in a good ways to compete with each other, uh, which, uh, which part of the world will get most number of surveys. So that was the good intention in terms of getting the participation, the maximum number of part participation from the, from the diaspora to come and voice out whatever uh, all the suggestion that you you may have i am the first person to work in collaborative i will come with my thoughts a little bit later at another time uh, martin and the rest how the different organization uh, the emotion organization from australia to the north america how we can form a common plat platform how we can dynamism how we can share our best practice practices no competition if we say compete means in terms of numbers who's getting most so then you are more dynamized to get more more and more people to part and participate to all lastly to all the Mauritians around the world listening now and who will listen at a later time in the recorded uh, streams uh, come up you participate just don't in a corner, fine, it is okay. You have a good time. You say this must be done. Da, 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 da. We, we come with thousands of ideas. Yes, it is fine. But the correct way of doing is come with the IOM. They have a system. Come, you voice out. These guys, they listen to you. These guys have taken our proposal. They have taken it to government of Mauritius. They have taken it to the council of ministers and the council of ministers, they have approved that. This is a big, big achievement. I have never, never, never seen that happening in the past. So congratulations to IOM and all the Mauritian friend keep it écoute-moi à Stella. C'est pas this BLD qui peut faire système Marseille. I'm saying that in Creole. Allez, mettre la main ensemble. Vini, vini causer ici. Ben là, je peux tendre. Tania peut tendre, il peut mettre ça dans papier. Il peut proposer, il peut faire. And the job of Martin and Emira and the team is to show us uh, in some time, in a time frame, what are the action taken, what are the tangible result in bridging Mauritius with the diaspora and vice versa. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Thank you. Shiv. And look, just just to echo what I could understand, <laughs> that you know, I, genuinely, that the spirit of, of collaboration and openness was was phenomenal with the diaspora. Once you know, we got through the sense of what the research was trying to achieve, so you can rest assured that one of the very early sections of, of this report talks about the sense of Mauritianness. Uh, and how we actually begin to build that and, and build pride in it. And I'll finish on this note from my end before my Irish gets me into more trouble. <laughs> you know, the, and the, this is something that a lot of diasporas tend to want to do anyway, but, and I think it needs to happen more. I think you should have mentioned, you know, the, the idea of celebrating ourselves more and, and having that pride in a, maybe in a more public display as well in many ways. But here's the good news for the Mauritian diaspora in all the regions that we looked at, the data backs up that the story of the Mauritian diaspora is one of achievement. So having that sense of pride and belonging, and if you look at the tagline of the report, when you see it, we say stories of belonging, stories of achievement, belonging, 
an opportunity. So that captures where we are. So I'll, I'll finish on that little tagline, tagline. And just to say again, thank you to everybody who filled it out. Thank you to all the advisory group members. But there's two people on this call as well. Obviously, thank you to Amira. She has to put up with me on a regular basis. You know, I'm working with an Irish person is never easy. <laughs> but, but most importantly, I, I wanted there's two people on the call and, and Celine couldn't join us today, but she, she kindly participated in the last two, two events. The, this project wouldn't have happened without the hard work of, of Tanya and Tanvi. They, they've been up at all crazy hours. It's late in the evening, <laughs> Sunday, Mauritius. You know, so I just want to place on record my personal thanks and, and just say well done to, to Tanya, to Tanvi, to Celine. And the song that's reminding in the back of my head, it's, it's we've only just begun. So look, keep the conversation going, keep talking with each other, and I'll hand back to Amira in case she has any final comments to add. Um, thank you all again. Uh, I'm conscious of time. I think we're past our uh, scheduled time, uh, but this has been very great uh, in terms of interaction and also comments and uh, on both Facebook and Zoom. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see a lot of uh, desire to engage and we've seen that before as well, so we don't doubt it at all. We've met uh, together with Martin, incredible people uh, throughout this journey of research. Uh, we've met friends and we're very happy about that. Um, um, we are, we're here uh, to, to help you uh, in terms of voicing out all the recommendations and uh, suggestions that you have. But as uh, she clearly pointed out and Yashoda, there's uh, ways of uh, basically you bringing up those recommendations and interactions and connectivity amongst each other, as well as to Mauritius, which I'm sure um, that that's it's to follow soon. Um, uh, you're very lucky to have IOM as a UN agency uh, who can serve as a brokerage for you. And um, IOM is extremely committed uh, to hear and listen to the diaspora and to help you in whatever ways uh, that you want to achieve your needs and your aims. So that is extremely important. Uh, we remain thankful with Martin to the IOM, as he mentioned, um, and definitely these webinars are are something that uh, IOM has been leading on in a great way. And I think that will continue, especially with the Diaspora Engagement Action Plan that we're building right now. Um, so I'm sure we will hear each other and talk to each other again. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks for everything. And thank you for your time. Uh, have a great, great Sunday and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thanks all. Tanya, is there anything you wanted to add? I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, thank you, Amira. I would just like to thank everyone and especially our guest speakers today, Sushiv and Yeshida. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your contribution and devotion towards Mauritius. So uh, we wish to continue this dialogue with you and all members of the diaspora and to engage on um, how to co-design the future with you. So just... Uh, highlighting our tagline from uh, last consultations and speaking crew following uh, Shiv on that. So cousin uh, we hear you and hope to to reflect your, your inputs and feedbacks in our work. So please uh, do uh, contact uh, Emira and Martin through the link shared so on Facebook and on, on the in the chat box. So this is the last session uh, of this series. So Thank you very much, Amy Ryan Martin, for leading the research, this research and this session. So I think on that note, I'll just wish everyone a, a good day, afternoon or night from wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye.